my name is Evan Douglas. For those who haven't met me, I know this is uh, uh, being presented live stream. Uh, I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, and before I introduce our distinguished speaker this evening, I'd like to say a few words about our annual Global Perspectives Lecture tonight, sponsored by my Dean's Leadership Council. On June 10th, 2020, in response to the brutal and senseless killing of George Floyd and the subsequent Black Lives Matter protests that emerged throughout the US and abroad, I issued a public statement as the Dean of the School of Architecture to our entire school community, voicing my grave concern about the obvious repugnant systemic racism and injustice that the black community continues to endure as an oppressed people in the US today. I felt it was imperative as an academic leader and a role model to our students to speak out forcefully in support of the spontaneous sense of outrage and anger expressed around the world concerning the immoral character of our nation and the urgency for radical change. In support of my call for action, my Dean's Leadership Council comprised of some of the school's most respected alumni issued the following public statement. And I quote, as witnesses to the intolerable acts of injustice and other atrocities against individuals of color throughout our lives and our nation's history. The members of the Dean's Leadership Council of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute School of Architecture wholeheartedly endorsed Dean Evan Douglas's June 10th, 2020 message to the RPI community. We extol this message throughout our nation and the world because it represents both the depth of anguish we each feel and our collective vision for an equitable future. The council is committed to the continued development of a civilized, virtuous society. As a result of their determined and passionate desire to make a real difference regarding the creation of a more inclusive community throughout the school and in recognition that all of our students will one day go out into the world as future leaders with the potential to contribute to a more fair and equitable society, my leadership council now serves as the primary sponsor of this important annual Global Perspectives, Perspectives Lecture. On behalf of the entire school, I wanna thank them for their generous support and heartfelt advocacy for meaningful social change. It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce this evening's speaker, Vivian Sansor, an internationally renowned artist, storyteller, researcher, and environmentalist deeply committed to seed conservation and agrobiodiversity as a global moral imperative today for our world community. Spiritually invested in the protection of biodiversity as a deeply cultural and political activity, Sansor uses images, sketches, films, soils, seeds, plants, and food in her contemporary creative practice as a means to bring to life old cultural tales surrounding our beautiful but fragile agricultural heritage. Born and raised in Palestine and educated as an anthropologist, she has created a life of advocacy in support of farmers and indigenous communities around the world that rely on the cultivation, vigor, and good fortune of their seeds, crops, and agricultural farming as their sole livelihood particularly interested in the shared inheritance within seed conservation that preserves our ancient relation to the earth and mother nature as an infinite source of nutrients, knowledge concerning environmental adaptation and the glorious string of diverse legacies handed down from one generation to the next surrounding food and farming, Sanser has a deep understanding and appreciation for the complex and intricate relationships that are contained within the genealogy of seeds. As part of her lifelong effort to educate and inspire others, she founded the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library located in the village of Batir and the El Bear Arts and Seed Studio in Bethlehem, both in Palestine, as well as the Traveling Kitchen Project. 
Considering the unsettling existential challenges we face collectively as a world community today regarding environmental degradation, the rise of political and ethnic strife we witness on a daily basis around the world, and the slow eradication of many of our shared cultural traditions, it's wonderfully refreshing to celebrate a voice of reason and insight in support of our shared collective memory, freedom, self-determination, community building, and the overall restoration of our planet. Please welcome Viv Vivian Sansor to RPI this evening. Wow, Evan, thank you. That's such a beautifully written and generous introduction. I, I don't know, I mean, if I can <laughs> <laughs> meet this grandiose introduction, but um, thank you so much for hosting me and also for being part of this global community that is uh, putting effort, whether we're institutions or whether we are in um, uh, community groups or grassroots, uh, whether we're in the field, where we're trying to design something else, uh, because something else is possible, hopefully anyway, but whether uh, we achieve it in our lifetime or not, at least we can move forward in life knowing that we have tried. Absolutely. And so I really appreciate you uh, taking uh, part in you know all of this and also inviting me um because we are now in this time where we have to recognize each other recognize each other as as partners uh beyond uh, old paradigms of nationalism and uh, other limited ideas so that we can actually create something else um I also I want to thank all the everybody who was patiently waiting. I'm, I'm so sorry I was late. I'm new to Boston and I got a little bit lost where I was. Um, anyway, but um, I, I see we have a lot of people and their names, which is great. Uh, so it, it's just you and me on video, right? Yes, yes. Cool. So I'll, I'll, I would like to give a, just a quick overview of my journey and then um, perhaps it'll be nice if people, uh, we can open it to questions. So I'm gonna share screen and please forgive me, I'm totally technically challenged, but we're gonna try to optimize this and do it. Uh, now it's asking me for a password. It didn't earlier. Okay. Yeah, it'll work. There you go. Yeah, you can see me, right? Yes, I can see it. Absolutely. Great. Um, so yeah, I like to always start uh, by sharing a story of M. Ahmed, who uh, has been uh, the woman who I met only one time, uh, but has inspired me uh, to do this work actually for a long time. Uh, and the story of Ahmed is that she is from the Dehesha refugee camp. As Evan mentioned, I was born and raised in Palestine. I'm from Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem, we have uh, three refugee camps. And one of them is called the Dehesha refugee camp, which is uh, the bigger camp and um, as uh, as it is the situation now in Palestine we live in several levels of layers of imprisonment basically uh, we you know it's there are people who are actually in political prison in Israeli jails and uh, there are people who are in refugee camps who were forced out of their homes uh, in 1948 and 1967 and became internally displaced people. And then within our cities, we are caged inside uh, a concrete wall and with a system of uh, segregation that makes it, for example, not possible for me to be on certain roads. Uh, and so uh, M. Ahmed lives in the refugee camp and the refugee camp often experiences a lot of raids, army raids at night, 
uh, and so one of uh, the things that also happen is that uh, many homes get demolished. Uh, this is all part of a greater policy to basically uh, eradicate people, uh, indigenous people, the Palestinian people in this case, uh, from their homeland. And uh, M. Ahmed has uh, uh, two, two sons. Uh, one was um, put in political prison for life, uh, 10 times for life meaning like he will never go out of jail. And then uh, her husband uh, was shot and was um, uh, became handicapped, disabled. Uh, and then their house was completely demolished. And so uh, I was actually doing my master's in anthropology. This was probably 15 years ago now or more. <laughs> and uh, I was asked by a British lawyer who was documenting her case if I could go and uh, offer interpretation uh, of her story. So there I was sitting in her home, uh, or not in her home, in the chicken coop, which became her home because her home was destroyed. And now she was living in the chicken coop with, uh, with her uh, daughter-in-law, her grandchildren, and her husband. And while we're sitting in the chicken coop, literally outside, uh, you know, trying to stay warm, uh, it was February, uh, Im Ahmed kept bringing these delicious uh, spinach bites and just sharing them with us. And while she was sharing, obviously, her, her horrifying story about how her house was demolished, uh, I couldn't resist, but like, be like, what is this? How how are we eating like the best food, which would be considered like if I were in New York, like gourmet, like organic food, uh, but like, how are we eating this uh, right here? And she took me to the back of the chicken coop um, and she showed me that on the ruins of her home, she had started a garden, a home garden, and that's where we were eating. She was, that's how she was feeding her family. And so for me, it was a really, really important moment to understand like the human ability to not just survive, but also design uh, new realities, even in the midst of completely dire situations and how a human capacity for design is really at the core of, uh, of survival as well. So this was one uh, initial story that kind of started me on the journey of seeds. Obviously, I was also born and raised in a what used to be a, a very rural uh, village, which is now a, a very urban town. Uh, but now, uh, but uh, sorry, hold on. There's a little bit of noise. Sorry about that. Um, so I, I grew up with a grandmother who basically... Uh, Imagine your little... Wait, I think it was... Can you not hear me? Hello? I, I can hear you, Vivian. Maybe Robert can turn off the mics of everyone. Oh, oh, I, I think, yeah, okay. That yeah. explains where the, okay, I understand. Um, so uh, I grew up with a grandmother who basically did everything in the garden and uh, produced for us also a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables. And I followed her, even though my grandmother really didn't like uh, girls, <laughs> I did follow her. Uh, and uh, I used to go and also clean up after her rabbits. Uh, and so I, I grew up with nature and I co-evolved with nature. And so my playground was these terraces where I would just discover things. Um, but now when I returned back home, my home, which used to be a lush biodiverse paradise uh, became basically what I call a cemetery because it's all buildings of concrete that are uh, built on top of each other inside this gigantic prison. And so all the biodiversity that we grew up with uh, is dying. So my work often people describe it about is about conservation and it is about conservation in a lot of ways, 
but actually it's also a lot about grief you know it's we're in constant state of grief of losing things that we once knew losing things that actually once gave us sense of tenderness or, or comfort uh, and these are things that are not just mushy things that we want to talk about. They're very real also for our survival. Because yes, indeed, we can survive as a human species, you know, and uh, walk around, eat, and, uh, you know, function. But actually, like, is that the way we want to survive as machines? Um, but again, you know, we're in a post-human world, so I don't know, we might be. Uh, but I, but this is my interest, which is like, I was trying to, you know, figure out how to deal with my grief, which was whether it was losing the spinach or losing the, the cauliflower or losing uh, the grapes that my grandmother used to crush and, and make into a fruit lather or whether it was just the, 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 the community activity of sharing food with each other, I felt that all of it, uh, a combination of basically political violence, neoliberalism, economic violence, and uh, a fast moving climate uh, crisis, uh, that you know, we have to do something. Like I would like to expand a little bit these tender spaces. And I found this tenderness in seeds. And as you can see, these are the seeds actually of heirloom spinach. And uh, you can tell in their cluster, you know, sometimes you look at them, you're like looking into space because these are several seeds. They're very spiky and they look like a planet of some sort. Um, but actually this is how the heirloom seed looks like. Uh, which is another world, like you enter it and it's like you entered another world. Um, and then I started to notice the difference between the commercial seed, which is actually perfectly rounded and smooth because the idea is we don't want to have to be, you know, deal with touching the seed even, you know, and, and being poked by it. Uh, but it is a big difference in terms of the taste and the flavor of, um, of the of the seeds, but this was one of my first seed harvests um, because I started to look for seeds and to also look for the stories of these seeds. And you know, I learned the story of Ahmed, but there were stories that everybody carried, you know, with the story of a seed or a crop. And one of the seeds that uh, became a big uh, obsession for me was the seed of these watermelons that people when I lived in the northern villages of Jenin, would talk about as uh, these wonderful watermelons that people miss so much. Uh, but I, I probably, I spent two years working with farmers in the north. And in those two years, there wasn't a day that I talked, I'm serious, like not a day that I talked to a farmer that they didn't mention this jadduai watermelon. And so, I was dying to understand like, where is this watermelon? And many women actually, uh, elder, elderly women in their eighties and seventies and eighties would even remember, they would say, oh, I gave birth in the watermelon field. Or someone would say, you know, we, we hid in the watermelon field during the war. Or people would put uh, the watermelon under the bed uh, in the summer and keep it cool for October, like that you would eat watermelon in the fall. Um, so there was a, a lot of stories around this watermelon. But when I asked about the watermelon, everybody would say, well, you're asking about the dinosaur. It doesn't exist anymore. And that's really how my journey started with like being unable to let go of the fact that, oh my God, there's this whole story that I'm losing and not me personally only, but like as a people we're losing, but also as a global community we're losing because the more I learned about these seeds, I learned that they are the product of design with uh, folks who actually cultivated them to co-evolve with the soil, to co-evolve with the 
micro different microclimates. So these watermelons that everybody was talking about actually grew with zero irrigation. They are part of a collection of seeds that we call Bali seeds. And Baal refers to the Canaanite deity of uh, fertility. And uh, so there's a whole system of knowledge that uh, actually goes around this, the, the cultivation of these seeds, uh, which means that um, you know, over literally thousands of years, people kept experimenting, uh, applying science and observation uh, to, to, to figure out how we can get a seed that can grow on thirst because we don't get a lot of rain or we only get rain in the winter. And so I started to look for these seeds and then I started to learn that there are actually people still with their names, like this lovely man here, uh, whose uh, name is actually Jadui. This is his uh, surname. So, but he didn't know. He didn't know why his name was Jadui. And so, and as you can see, he's actually, uh, he has, there are uh, date trees in the back. Uh, and that's because he is now uh, working in this agribusiness uh, plantation basically for dates, uh, which is where I met him. Uh, and this in, the, in this very place was a very biodiverse and lush uh, farms in the past. But I realized when, when he didn't, when I met him and he said his name was Jadu, and I was telling him, oh, like the watermelon that he didn't know what that is, that actually this was the true tragedy, that the more we lose these stories, the more we lose the system of knowledge, we're actually losing ourselves. And there's a lot of danger with losing ourselves. It's not just this romantic notion about like, oh, I wanna know myself and I wanna, no, it's actually uh, the way you walk in the world, the way you move in the world. And also, again, when I keep talking about design because it's something that's really important, how to be intentional in the world today and how important it is to be better designers, but we can't be better designers if we don't even know what the color palettes are, you know, who are we? Um, so the story continued by uh, me going from different places, uh, asking people if they've heard of the Wajadui watermelon. And a lot of people, again, continued to say, oh, well, nobody has it anymore. Until I met um, Khadr Abu Ghattas, who is actually funny enough, in, he lives in my hometown. So I was looking all over the country, but he was next door. Uh, and I just went in there the first time and I was like, oh, have you heard of this Jadui watermelon? And he's like, uh, what, Jadui, I have some, you want those seeds here, have them, nobody wants them. And it was uh, a very powerful moment because um, again, the, the, the thing that to say nobody wants them was huge for me because it, it, it was like someone telling me we don't want who we are. And that's when I started to be a little bit more diligent in looking for more and more of these seeds. And I found that uh, the places to find those seeds were literally in the old jars and old empty chocolate tin, tin boxes that uh, mostly old ladies kept uh, different seed varieties and different plants. And with the extinction of seeds, we're also talking about extinction of like the linguistical diversity because um, even as in Arabic, for example, in Palestine, we say for the word uh, seed, it's the same word for the zariya, uh, which means also plant, uh, but it also me means children. So people refer and introduce sometimes uh, their children as a zariati or, oh, this is your zariya, these are your seeds. Uh, and, and that made me think a lot more about what does it mean also the extinction of, the, of this diversity of seeds with each seed having a story? Uh, it was kind of, again, like a very literal and metaphoric uh, 
awakening to say, oh, this is the extinction of our cultural identity, our cultural heritage, and our cultural diversity. You know, we don't all have to eat the same zucchinis. You know, some of the zucchinis are a little lighter, some darker, some uh, taste a little bit more uh, buttery, some more watery, uh, some need more water, some need less water. And how do we actually take these seeds as our teachers that can teach us how, you know, the more you have in your toolbox, the more able you are to be autonomous, the more able you are to imagine and apply this imagination to the world you want to create. Uh, this is uh, just a picture with uh, Hajj Hamoudi. Hajj Hamoudi is 106 years old. So this journey kind of took me to all kinds of places and I was so honored to meet amazing people like Hamoudi. And Hamoudi is a, is a nickname for, but uh, his name is Muhammad basically. And basically he's lived, he's lived 106 years. So he has seen it all uh, from, uh, British colonialism to, uh, you know, the, first the Ottomans, he was there, the British, he was there, now Israel, uh, and you, the uh, Zionist project, and then uh, the Palestinian authorities here. So he has seen it all. And um, when I was asking him about, you know, why I was there, I was asking him about wheat because I was very interested in wheat. Uh, and he said, you're not here looking for wheat, you're here uh, looking for yourself. And that was also a very powerful moment because I got to be humbled and also know that he's right. You know, he knows as a 106 year old that so much has changed and so much has changed to the point where we look at ourselves and there's a lot of familiarity, but we're not sure what we're looking at. And I think this is where we are in the world. We're in this bridge moment where we, we're, not, we're not who we used to be, but we are not who we are becoming either. And, and that's why these conversations are so imperative right now, uh, because as we are sitting on this bridge, we're gonna have to make some serious tough decisions on individual levels and also on global uh, levels. Um, and I wanna share with you, I, 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 again, about the genius of human design when it comes to food. Uh, this, is, uh, this picture is of Imsami. And uh, in this very picture, Imsami grows both broccoli, which is a, a, new, a newly developed crop, relatively modern crop, and particularly in Palestine, it's a new crop, um, and the heirloom cauliflower. And the heirloom cauliflower, which we call Zahra Baladiye, uh, actually sits in the ground, the seed, for nine months, exactly as long as a child uh, stays, I mean, a baby sits in a, a mother's womb. So, so uh, we wait, with great anticipation uh, every year for the season of the cauliflower. And it is uh, quite uh, an amazing tradition. Uh, this picture that you're seeing is an auction actually. It's like a beauty pageant where people uh, come and they bring their cauliflowers that, you know, again, it grows for nine months with no water, no irrigation. It lives off of water uh, from the winter, water retained in the soil. Um, and so, uh, and actually in, in, in my practice, I often combine a lot of obviously storytelling, but because I find these stories fascinating, like how can a tradition like this disappear, which it is, um, but also how can we take these old traditions of like, this is kind of cool, you know, like, you'd go, you take your cauliflower, now you have an auction. And, and also because the farmers have so much autonomy in this case, they own the seed uh, and uh, they are their own basically boss, but also they also decide the price 
because it's their cauliflower, they get to decide how much it's worth. And, and this is very important in terms of having economic autonomy for farmers, because as long as uh, in today's world, most farmers are basically subject to companies that come and decide basically this is how much we're gonna pay. Um, but what that, what that does isn't just keep, uh, keep a farmer less independent economically. What it does, it takes away this imagination uh, which led to the development of this heirloom cauliflower, which led to the development of the wheat, which led to the development of the Jadwai watermelon. Um, there's some scribbles coming on my screen. How did that happen? It, did someone just do this or was here? Yeah. I'm not sure how that, that, that was accomplished. Uh, that is magic. We're talking about magic, and there it is. <laughs> Maybe that's the the cauliflower drawing a, a, a note back to you. Yeah, amazing. Actually, I want to draw your attention to the background here. I'm trying to get the. Uh, I don't think that my light is bad. Hold on, because it's a painting by an artist named Aida Arafe. It's not complete yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, we see. We yeah. see. Yeah, and yeah. it's basically based on this image. And it's an acrylic painting. And the idea of this is that we're gonna uh, basically make a series of this beautiful flower uh, and, and it's different stories. In this case, this is an auction uh, in the Jordan Valley, which is a valley that is, is going through a lot of transformation uh, because of climate change and policies that have actually rendered a lot of these communities basically thirsty. Um, but I, I feel like I, I talked a lot and maybe I should, how much time do we have? No, no, we're fine. Go, go, okay. Vivian, go right ahead. It uh, was okay. very important. Okay, cool. What you're sharing with us. So just, this is another crop. Uh, it's called uh, Heti Yisoda, which means, uh, well, it just means it's the name of the, it's gone again. What is this? Uh, and uh, I started also, I fell in love with this wheat uh, completely. I was in the field uh, visiting this very particular farmer. His name is Khaldun in the Southern uh, Hills of Bethlehem. And it's a semi-desert area. And this wheat grows on complete, like no irrigation zero irrigation. I mean, this is very important because we're talking about a global crisis that's needing more more these kinds of varieties. You know, we have droughts in California, for example, and, and we, need, we need varieties. Like I grow um, heirloom almonds in Palestine that require no irrigation. And we know that in California, one of the main problems why we have droughts is how much the water is used to irrigate massive almond fields. So imagine if we actually apply our ability to imagine a crop and our, and our knowledge of science that you know, doesn't require so much irrigation and we can have eat almonds without destroying the planet. Um, and, uh, and so this is a, a wheat called Abu Samra and uh, Abu Samra literally means dark and handsome. And so I started to look for its story. And uh, as I talked to particularly like women who needed the bread of Abu Samra, they'd often talk about it as this kind of lover that just disappeared. And so um, I collaborated with a musician named uh, Zaid Ihlal and uh, Zaid created a song for Abu Samra. It's a love song, but it was an important uh, collaboration because uh, Khaldun here, when we first were like, can you please grow a lot of it for us? He was like, oh my God, nobody wants to buy this. Nobody knows what this is. And so uh, I'm gonna send my, my sheep to graze it. And I was like, you can't do that. Oh my God. Uh, and so we had to convince him not to do that. And then in order to you know, in, reintroduce this ancient, but kind of new now variety to, um, to to our community and to younger generation, we obviously uh, wanted to, 
to do something. And, and a song by a popular young artist was really, really powerful because there's there are these kids now listening to this pop song and wondering what is he talking about? And then uh, now calling this farmer saying, I wanna taste it. I wanna taste my history. I wanna taste this uh, Abu Sombra. And so it was like kind of the return of this dark and handsome lover. Um, this is my great grandmother, Jamile, and my father. This is a picture in the 1930s. Um, and uh, anyway, it's a long story, but uh, um, it's, I'm often told that my great grandmother's Jamile's tomato, who I've never met her, uh, were so delicious that people in our town still talk about it. Um, I, I don't, I want to kind of um, skip through this a little bit. Uh, for I'd love to have more of a Q&A situation soon, but I will uh, just share about this, which is uh, the Traveling Kitchen Project. It's a project that came out of the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library, which I established yeah. after basically finding a lot of these seed varieties and working with uh, teachers to work with their students to basically document these stories and learn more about their agricultural and uh, heritage. But one of the challenges we had was again that people didn't know about these varieties. And so I wanted a kitchen that uh, can fold or come apart and fit in my car so that I can go to places where the kitchen itself becomes a catalyst, a seed itself, to have a conversation. So people would come around and ask, what is this? Uh, and we would cook these heirloom varieties uh, with folks so that people can, again, eat their history, but also as a research platform where we can have an intergenerational conversation. And one of the things that um, I think is very challenging in our modern day society is that we're so segregated generationally. So like you have a playground for kids and uh, a home for the elderly. And so you actually never benefit from the exchange of people who have lived decades before you, or, you know, they know a thing or two, you know? Uh, and so it was for me a way to bring back that intergenerational communion, if you will. And so, and it worked uh, beautifully in that everywhere we went, we set it up and uh, people would just gather and, and have conversations about like, oh, what are these beans you're, you know, I, I haven't seen them in a while. Or someone would come and say, oh, well, we used to cook it with, uh, I don't know, a fenugreek or something. And then you'll be curious, like, oh, I didn't know this was here. And then, and then it just becomes a, a really vibrant way to engage community in also becoming the designers of, of their food system. So for example, in some villages where we went, um, people decided that they wanted to work with the farmer directly and create their own co-op and, and bring the food every week and, and do their own thing. So the work is more like, I, I describe my work more as a pollinator where I just go and kind of plant the seed, you know, and then people take it on, you know, I, there's no need to, uh, uh, to do anything else after. And, and right now I'm working actually on, a, on an exhibition at Photo Industria Biennale in Bologna in Italy. And I'm, I'm actually designing a kitchen that has wings because uh, the, the kitchen sort of, it went from having wheels to then often flying to different places in the world, uh, including, for example, um, in London, where uh, I, I did this whole uh, project where I basically cooked Jamaican food in honor of my friend who was a seed saver and passed away, who was Jamaican. And in every time you do that, uh, the kitchen transforms and it becomes uh, a communal space to, to, to talk about the things that we're grieving and to talk about the things we're dreaming and to talk about the things we want to design for our future. Uh, the kitchen also with its wings flew to the south side of Chicago 
2019, where um, actually I participated in the Chicago Architecture Biennial. And uh, as part of a public program, I cooked berries that I collected from a destroyed village in Palestine in the south side of Chicago at Sweetwater Foundation. And that was a very powerful experience because, uh, I mean, I think the, you all are familiar with the south side of Chicago and the severe injustices that folks endure there. And so for us to share our story and for me to have these dried berries from Palestine to cook with, we literally ate each other's histories. And when that happened, we became also uh, carriers, like partners in carrying this grief, but also participating in figuring out together, how do we design something different? Um, this is an image, for example, of a project uh, uh, called Home I did in Bethlehem. It was also revolving the kitchen where um, in this, this is Mluchiyya that we're cooking and it was uh, cooked based on, you know, I want, I planted this Mluchiyya in honor of uh, Abed, who's a 12 year old uh, boy who was shot coming home from school uh, by Israeli snipers. And when they found his body, um, you know, the, the, his mom told me that they found a bag of chips in his pocket because he was going home and he was hungry. He was going home for lunch from school. And, um, and, I, and I kept thinking about that and, and how we're all deprived, especially young children of the feeling of home, of safety. And so actually this is uh, in the area close to where he was shot, where we sat down to cook and to cook a lunch together and to reclaim our time, reclaim our sense of safety, even in the midst of everything. But in order to do that, we had to clear a lot of the terraces from a lot of shrapnel, a lot of, uh, there were grenades that were thrown there, uh, buckets, we got bucket, we were like 16 volunteers for four days, just clearing out the soil. So literally we have destroyed uh, our soil in our case have been completely destroyed by, by, by this oppression and this violence. And um, I mean, it was a powerful project for me and I think for the people who participated because we also sat down and cooked together. And when we sit down and cook together, it's not just cooking together here, we're preparing the leaves. Uh, this is a typical Palestinian dish, but it this this crop, which is a mallow, it originates in Africa, but was domesticated in Palestine, and it's a staple dish. Uh, but to de-leaf, uh, you have to sit together, and when you sit together all day doing this activity, you're also telling each other stories. And stories, again, are really important because they help us make sense of the world. Um, this is a, this is me foraging uh, another kind of mallow, wild mallow in California. And I, I like to show this picture because I remember that, and this is a long uh, uh, story also, but basically foraging also, which now is a hipster thing and it's a cool thing. Uh, it requires access to land and to space. And so uh, here I was, for example, in this open space in California, uh, foraging for mallow without anyone bothering me. Well, except the guys who were mowing the lawn thinking it's, it's just weeds. Uh, for me, it was food and I was so excited to, to, to find it there. Uh, but um, you see here in this picture to the left, um, this is how it is to forage for the same plant in Palestine now. How do you sever people from their food source, from their land? is by you know, severing them from their, from, from their lands. Uh, and so uh, it, it's really important also as we're walking around you know, in open spaces to, to, to question like, does everybody have uh, the very basic right to enjoy nature, to be part of nature? And, and why is it that it's not? 
Um, finally, I want to just share with you this, and I think I'll stop. I'd like to do the Q&A. Uh, this, this is how like the seeds sort of became this collaborator with so many people around the world. Uh, the one on the right is uh, a seed art packet that we developed at the Hudson Valley with the Hudson Valley Seed Library. And it was a very beautiful collaboration because uh, our, I sent some seeds of Yaktin. Well, they flew, I don't know how they got to the Hudson Valley. And, uh, and then this gourd that kept, which we call the mother, uh, kept growing like crazy in the Hudson Valley. Uh, and now, you know, it's, it's available, you know, for people in New York, it adapted in New York. And we started growing it uh, in New York at the same time I was growing it in Palestine during the pandemic. And, you know, just talking about the different stages of how it was growing and how it was doing, uh, it kept us really connected. Uh, you know, between uh, Ken, who is uh, of the Hudson Valley Seed Library uh, Seed Company and myself in Palestine. And it was this kind of baby we had together. But it was, again, um, also interesting to see how it adapted in New York and how it did in New York and how this co-creation that happened between uh, folks in New York who were growing it and what they did for it, what they built for it to climb on, was different than what we did. And it was an interesting exchange of how like uh, this new, new crop basically was welcomed and introduced and how we got to learn about each other uh, through it. So um, yeah, just to wrap it up, uh, the work that I do is very much based on kind of a, a desire to reclaim our imagination and to say that we are uh, dynamic uh, beings and we must be in relationship with everything around us uh, in, a, in a humble relationship where we can use art. We And for me, farming is a form of art uh, as well, uh, where we can use music, whatever we need to use to imagine something different because I'd rather really die than continue to live in a world that is so harsh and so brutal. And really the seeds, nature, um, relationships that are created through all of that, for me, allow us to create these tender spaces with hopes that, you know, if we all kind of create our own tender space, we can then expand it into uh, other realms and with other people. So, yeah, and thank you for listening. And oh, Vivian, thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, as I say to all my uh, guest speakers, and uh, certainly in your case, if, if we were together and in real time, in real space, uh, we would be in a very large uh, room in, in uh, our theater space on campus and the students would be in front of you as well as the faculty. Uh, they'd be applauding you right now and thanking you for uh, sharing with us your your unique insight. And and you know, uh, it's interesting. That it seems to me the best of art and architecture uh, is is a form of uh, storytelling. It's it's about maybe uh, helping us like a mirror see something in the world around us that. Um, we may not see due to the abundance of distraction and noise. And, and maybe, uh, again, in the best of cases, the gifts that come back not only resonate with us now, but resonate with us for many years to come. So um, clearly you're at this, it's a really, really unique project because it's at the intersection uh, between uh, people and 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 the legacies of people uh, attributed or transported through seeds and food and rituals, and it it speaks to simultaneously to uh, social and and environmental justice. Uh, it speaks to 
the the eradication or loss of of, of cultural rituals, which are happening on a continuous basis due to globalization, and and of course the the um, the vulnerability and 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 dangers that threaten our environment. So there there's such a a fantastic constellation of issues that are emerging from your work. And although you're you are uh, you're very modest and 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 generous in in the way you 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 present the project. The fact is, like that um, kitchen that has wings, uh, your entire project has has the capacity from from a from a kind of grassroots perspective uh, to proliferate through a variety of means and actually change the world. It could, in theory, right? I mean. I'm I'm reminded of uh, what is it um, agroecology and and the um, the the kind of almost ideological debate between the multinational corporations that descend down around the world and impose on the world these regulatory uh, structures that force local communities into having to uh, deal with pesticides and fertilizers and hybridized seeds and, and a financial dependence on these corporations, which is, is, is rather, excuse the term deadly, it's not sustainable, versus the local community saying, we, we may not have a lot of economic and political power, but we have an enormous amount of knowledge that has been uh, obtained, accumulated over, uh, centuries that that allow us to understand how to become stewards of the planet and might you listen to us uh, might you consider our point of view in so far on some level is that we all have something invested in keeping the planet safe so i i brought that up because because as a kind of grassroots proposition although it it may um meet only a certain number of people at any one time, your creative practice, as a model and as a, uh, uh, a strategy of engagement, it, it has an infinite scale of influence. So I'm just, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for saying that. And in a lot of ways, I think you're right, not because uh, this is what I'm doing, but because I think uh, this is the only way, which is to uh, create, like I said, our own little spaces, because we need to expand them. You know, we, we may not have, um, the economic power, as you said, for example. Uh, but what we do have is the knowledge, but we also have survival skills. Mm -hmm. uh, we have stories, we have, I mean, I think we have a very important question to ask in every situation, which is, where is my power? Like we are often put in these helpless situations, right? And 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 the way that uh, people have kind of accepted uh, the status quo of the dominant world is by accepting that you know, yeah, this is the way, and there is no other way. Uh, but I, I actually, just the mere fact. And I'm, the more and more I'm like actually meeting people in my life and, and learning, uh, I, I, am, I am bewildered by how much the fact, like I was talking to someone recently and he's trying to uh, liberate himself from, uh, uh, you know, the dominant world basically. And he said, well, nobody told me that something else was possible. And I think that this is really like not just a casual thing. Like it's true that we're told like, you have to go to college, you have to do it this way. You have to eat with a fork and knife. You have to, the possibility that 
you can, uh, I don't know, eat with your hands is not part of the narrative of the dominant world because the narrative of the dominant world is that there's only one way. And instead, like, how do we kind of braid different threads from all different ways uh, in order to make like something beautiful? And I think for me, the idea that also in the dominant world, we dismiss so much the, 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 the heart as if like, we just need rational thinking and that's it. Uh, I think it was such a big mistake and it takes away uh, from, we are animals, you know, we have instincts and they're intelligent. Um, and I think it's impossible to, to continue to live in a world where the heart, which I believe is much wiser and stronger than the brain, um, mm. is completely dismissed. And, and the heart is so powerful. I know when I speak like that, uh, especially, I mean, I'm at Harvard, so academic world, like, uh, but when you speak about the heart as also a, a, a major resource, in fact, as the guide rather than uh, the thing you must dismiss, I, I believe like for me, it was my heart that created all of this because I, I couldn't, I couldn't, it was, I was so in love right. uh, and I, I was fighting for this love basically. And it's considered cheesy to say things like that. So how do we actually make space for that so that whatever we create, there is an allowing of our, our realness, which is very much based on the heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it, it's interesting because Certainly, your 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 homeland. You're dealing with a a far more, uh, oh my God, kind of spiritually and and ethically charged situation that that threatens the very existence of of a community. Um, and while this may, may not be comparable, uh, you know, I I would certainly call attention to the fact that as an American citizen, uh, our democracy is at risk here because of partisan politics, because of misinformation, uh, because of the big lie. Um, but, uh, and, and you could even argue maybe kind of uh, 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 multinational uh, corporations have assumed a disproportionate amount of, of control over the, the, the general public. But it, you know, it, one has to step back and say, well, okay, so how, how do we overcome these, these extraordinary threats and, and dangers and, and um, the kind of immorality that we're seeing in many places around the world? And what's so kind of beautiful about your particular project and one of a number of the reasons why I reached out and invited you is because I, I think you, 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 you kind of see the seed conservation and its relation to food and, and farming and agriculture, all as a kind of universal language. It's like a beautiful song that is able to cut through uh, all the noise, all the hate, uh, all the kind of institutional kind of corruption and discrimination and, and oppression and fear and all that stuff and say, listen, we're, we're actually one family. And, and, and those differences are profound and poignant. And if you can, if you, you were talking about eating one's history, you know, it, uh, food doesn't, doesn't come uh, with that kind of bias. In fact, if anything, and again, maybe I'm speaking for myself because not everyone, <laughs> is enlightened about the, the beauty of different cuisines around the world, but it seems to me it's one of the most extraordinary journeys to learn the, wor the world through food and through the rituals of, of cooking and eating and congregating around food and the smells and the aromas. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it, it's not simple, it's not prosaic. It may be common, but it actually binds us all together. And I think you've, 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 
you're you're holding on to to the to a language that's timeless and and one that is able to move rather freely with with very little resistance and i'm i'm being overly poetic here but 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 i do think that's maybe one of the the powers of your critique and form of resistance that's built into the project well um but also actually in in when i first started doing this work i was really focused on the resistance bit like how how do we resist uh all that's happening around us right and and there is a, obviously a place for that and then i started to think about creation right uh you know how how does creation actually um sort of uh shift the focus you know to what do i want which is actually not such a simple question it's a very hard question especially when uh, it's not a question just for you individually. That's why knowing who we are is so important as, as people, as individual, and then as community, uh, it's, it's really important because then you can say like, oh, okay, um, what do I actually want to create? Like I'm, I'm in shit here, for example, I'm really sitting in, can you say that in academia? Uh, yeah. But like, I'm, I'm sitting here in the mud and I'm stuck. So what can I, what can my hands reach that I can actually create? And the more I can weave something outside of the mud, maybe I'll create um, something that'll pull me out that I'll even forget that I'm in the mud. Right. You know, recently I was on a farm in Michigan and I met this um, incredible uh, person whose name is Bob. And uh, he created something called Earthworks Music in Michigan. And he is a biologist conservationist. And he actually used to work in, in academia and then decided to buy this farm out in Michigan and, and move to it. And as soon as he moved there, he got very sick and became paralyzed. Oh, so he had just quit his dominant world job and he moved to the countryside and then became paralyzed. And of course you would think that uh, he would just give up and go back to the office or something. But instead he decided that he needed to learn about the community around him. And basically he started bringing people uh, to do stuff with him. And so this farm is this incredible place. Like you walk in, it's another world within the world. Yeah. And it's because this guy didn't just create it by himself. I mean, he, he is still um, paralyzed, but he created a very dynamic and a world that actually moves a lot. <laughs> it, it's really amazing to watch how the the power of deciding to instead of resisting his paralysis right uh creating something else and i think it's 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 our only choice honestly because i, I mean i don't know like i mean i'm happy to explore other choices but this was and and seats for me were definitely just watching how they also shift and change based on environment and also seeing that we are seed like you're a seed you're sitting there in your own environment and this is how you kind of develop also right you react to what's around you um and yeah seeds are a universal language because we are seeds and because uh, we all eat and so um I, I like to think that yeah the seeds are a wonderful platform to to, to also reclaim presence for all the people and the things and the and the history and uh, and the future that you know is being denied. Yeah, yeah, I, I do want to underscore uh, something you said, which was a um, you wanted to clarify because I I had used the word resistance, and and in in other words, you were saying, look, I'm about building bridges. And, and, and in order to overcome this kind of seemingly impossible situation that threatens my existence, um, I'm going to construct uh, ladders and, 
and birds and planes and, and uh, strategies of flight as a way to, to kind of dissolve that, that, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of horrible situation. And I, and I think you've done that. Um, well, there is, I guess, you know, in, in some other words, is a kind of, it, it's, it, it was, it is a resistance to the reality also. Like, I am not interested in reality. I, I, I find reality, like people will say, oh, you have to be realistic. I'm like, no, I don't. I really, I really don't want to be realistic. That's <laughs> not the world I want to live in. Or people tell me, oh, you have to look at the glass half full. I'm like, I shattered the whole glass. I'm not interested in the glass. Uh, and I wish that uh, we'd all just take this stupid glass that everybody wants us to compromise with and say, oh, just take the glass half full and just freaking shatter it because I, I think it's a very mediocre way to look at the world, to say, I'm just gonna, uh, oh, I'll just accept. Uh, I guess I have a hard time just accepting reality. I'm not interested in that. You know, although it wasn't, the term wasn't used this evening in your presentation, I have read it a number of times in things that you've written uh, and and interviews, and about your your deep appreciation and, and interest in magic. Yes, I do. And, and I, I I suppose in in you know to to extend something you just said, you're not interested in reality. I mean, one one constructs their reality. Mm. Right, and and you can you can do it through different forms of of of, uh, of fiction and fables and storytelling and myths, and and they're just as real as anything else. In fact, they may be more real. So I, I I'm curious if you could say a little bit about how when did magic appear on your horizon as a young girl and. And 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 how do you use it as a as a kind of productive uh, proponent of change? Thank you so much for this question. It's beautiful how you you framed it. Uh, yeah, I love magic so much, and I wonder sometimes if it's because I I find solace. Uh, or it's because it really does exist in my world. Um, but I've come to, and I, and my sisters used to tell me, come back to earth, you know, you're, uh, and, and I think there was a moment where I actually made an internal decision that I, I don't actually, I'd rather <laughs> live in, if, if, even if I'm crazy and this is all like a figment of my imagination, I'd rather be there. Uh, so yeah, for me, I think magic started very early on as a child, uh, where, like I mentioned, I grew up in these like in these hills. Like there was no um, no one telling us what to play and how to play. And I think kids these days are deprived of that. They're even told what the game is. Sure. We had to come up with our game. You know, we had, we sometimes it was like, oh, let's try to make something from the soil and build something. Of course, it never worked. It was just, you know, it's not more <laughs> or, uh, or yeah, we saw, you know, people making clay pots or oh, let's try it with like the dirt that's, out. I mean, it just didn't work, but, uh, but then it's the butterfly, like, everything was like, I discovered it by myself, by, you know, falling and breaking my, 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 my leg or whatever, just like really discovering it. And so um, then as everybody, like uh, all of us in the world, uh, most, most people, uh, I was told that no, you know, this is, you know, I really need to kind of wash up and sit up and, and, and wear a suit and tie and, and go to college because I will not be valuable in the world if I didn't. And if I didn't live in the city and if I didn't speak English and if I didn't, you know. And so I actually started to hate nature and magic, not hate, but like I, I left it because mm -hmm. I wanted to be in the city. I wanted to be, you know, quote unquote, civilized. I believed the lie like you uh, very well mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then I realized at some point that that life was so for me void of that magic and so it was 
this this moment when I returned to the magic of soil and plant and flower and you know birds in particularly uh, in particular, I was like, why would I ever leave that? You know, I don't. So I I try to combine now also the magic of science because I love science too. I think science is magical, including social science and, and architecture and all. So like, how do we find the magic? How do we marry the magic that's already there with the magic of the human imagination? You know, there's so much magic when you put a seed in the ground that looks like nothing and then especially like a lettuce seed, they're so light they just, and, and oh, poof, suddenly you have a, a lettuce that you're crunching on and it's becoming part of your body and it eats the sun rays and it becomes like, this is crazy magic. Uh, yeah. So I think when you look at these things for me, uh, when you believe in magic, then you can believe also that something else is possible. Beautifully, beautifully said. I, I'm now going to uh, read a comment question from one of our faculty members, Christiana. Uh, I really like this idea that the seeds are cultivated for long periods of time in situ and place, that over time they are more and more attuned to the local soil, the climate, etc. How do you feel these practices of attunement are coordinated, negotiated, and more among humans? Or is it more the pursuit of an individual or family who carrying a seed and its legacy forward? Is it more about cultivating a garden independently? The reason I ask is to attune architecture to site like the seeds could provide some of the positive futures you were speaking about in terms of cultivating a reciprocity between architecture and its surrounding environment. Perhaps another question, uh, when or how do these moments of change from one thing to another occur in the work you were engaged with? Um, well, it's a lot of questions, but I'll try to uh, answer in the way I think I understood. Uh, thank you for these questions because actually I've been trying to engage some of the folks that do a lot of uh, architecture rehabilitation of old buildings uh, in Palestine in a conversation about like, what is, how, how, like, okay, you come to renovate a place or you come to build a place, uh, how do you consider uh, the terrain? Like, how do you consider, you know, the history of the place and, and the, the community of a place? Because the structure is, we hope, is a living is a living structure too like that it would be something that reflects a, a, a dynamic life rather than just a, a monument right mm -hmm. um i don't know if i'm answering the question properly but i i, I think the question is if, if i understand the question is how how do you how did you understand the question how do you well um Well, I think the, the, the primary term to me is a tune. You know, it's a form of listening mm. and, and, and enabling uh, all of these different media to somehow participate in a kind of co-collaboration. And, and, and to the extent that change is to emerge, uh, uh, how might the seed, how, how, how might the recipe uh, how might the ritual uh, undergo a modification to accommodate those changes? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So yeah, I think that it's the the listening is really important, uh, uh, and the humility. I think humility is often uh, forgotten, especially when you know we have, uh, for example. Uh, you know, modern tools to do stuff, we go into space and we think, oh, we, we, have, we have solutions for this. Uh, and we miss out so much uh, because we, we can't humble ourselves. We think we have answers. Uh, we really sometimes, I think, have to move into a place, almost ask permission to step into it. Uh, and not almost, I mean, literally ask permission. Like I sometimes go into the forest, like ask permission because like our presence is often disruptive. 
uh, and then really like be observant of everything around not just the humans but the plants and 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 how then conversations like sometimes it's really as basic as really taking the time to have a lot of conversations with people even people you don't know like a lot of my seed collection came as a result of lots lots of tea and coffee with people I know and people I don't know uh and just allowing my, myself to actually feel this space and understand what, what is this space asking for. And the space is not just a, a physical space, it's, it's, it's a wholesome space with all living beings in it, like the people living there, the, the, the animals living there. Uh, so how, how we, and I think like, for example, in Chicago, when they asked me to come and do an installation, I really didn't want to bring just the Palestinian heirloom seed library there right uh, and so we spent a month in the forest uh, actually just understanding where are we uh, before we started building and we built with uh, wood that uh, was uh, destroyed in the in, in a storm in Michigan uh, I don't know if this answers the question but I, I think I think there's an answer within the question that was proposed, which is uh, really the listening bit is so, so important. And there's so much that also can be heard outside of people's words. It's not what people, like when you ask a question, people answer you, but it's, it's in, the, in the parts where they are not answering the question uh, that you actually get the answer. And to, to be sensitive enough in your heart to hear that bit, not because people will often answer what they think they need to answer. No, 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 that was a beautiful answer. And, and Christiana, feel free to, uh, to help us in the chat if there was something that yeah. you in particular that wasn't answered. And I urge all of the students, come on, you have, you have an opportunity uh, to engage in a kind of beautiful conversation here and there may be something that we haven't discussed this evening that's important to you. I mean, this, th these, these lectures are not for the Dean. I, I guarantee you, I assure you, um, I, I could simply contact Vivian, uh, independent of RPI and find out what she's doing or, or kind of look her up, which, which I have and learned a lot, but it's really about you guys. This is, you know, it's about strategizing and reimagining your future and and looking at different kind of roadmaps, blueprints, you know, uh, different uh, strategies of engagement, you know, because um, Vivian, we have a we have a course called entrepreneurship and architecture. Uh, and and although it, it 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 privileges business, it's intended really to highlight the the fact that that the students have to uh, take ownership uh, over their, their future destiny, their imagination, and the way in which their imagination engages the, the world at large. And, and I want to be a student at your school. I mean, oh, it's so much fun. So. Oh, it's great. Well, why don't you, you apply? I, I know the Dean and I, I'm, I'm certain you could, you could become an architect here. Wow, that's great. I think I have a long way before I become an architect. Thank you. But I think I, I raised that because I think, and you didn't speak a lot about your trajectory as a young woman, uh, and you're still young, uh, from from your homeland in Palestine to your studies uh, as an anthropologist to the moment you kind of declared yourself as a uh, uh, conservationist and someone who would who would create a seed library. Mm. Um, and this this is I'm sure this was radical in your family. I, I'm my sense is that there wasn't anyone really around you that was doing the same thing and there was a certain amount of, of, of anxiety and maybe discomfort as to whether this was appropriate, whether you'd be respected, whether you, you'd have the freedom of thought and you could have an impact. And clearly you have had that, but maybe you could speak a little bit about that journey you know, because it, it certainly would resonate with the students as they decide in the coming years ahead uh, how to 
design their own life, not based on what we tell them, on, on what the, the, the kind of, uh, how should we say it, the dominant uh, power structure is in the architectural discipline, but based on their heart and their mind combined. Wow, uh, big question. Um, before I, I, I answer your question, I wanna share a small, short little story that actually happened recently that has inspired me and, and I think uh, many, many people around the world and particularly in Palestine, which is the story of three amazing men, I'm uh, sorry, six amazing men who um, are political prisoners in Israeli prisons because they were uh, very politically active. Uh, some of them weren't even that politically active. They were two of them were in prison for life and they were taken when they're 20. So now they're in their 40s. Uh, I'm in my 40s. Uh, but they actually uh, are in a high security prison and they, with a spoon, dug a tunnel oh outside God. of uh, this high security Israeli prison. And I'm talking about this is a, a, in the now in the time of, of great surveillance and technology where you can't be uh, butt caught. So they knew that their journey to freedom would take years of actually carving uh, a tunnel, a tunnel inside um, the prison. Uh, but it speaks of a that they knew the soil, and that's why it's important that. We are people of the soil, but uh, be that they really like the real. They are in a high security prison. There's nothing around you that could possibly uh, give you any sign that you should even have hope. Like hope probably would feel very dangerous in that situation, and and the amount of trust that they would have had to have amongst themselves, each other to to have carved basically over the years with a spoon, a spoon, one spoon, uh, their freedom. And they were free for four days. And one of the, the young men who was caught was when they were both, sorry, the, the six of them were sadly arrested again and tortured. And one of them is in intensive care. Um, but one of them wrote a letter before, and he left it for his mother before he was uh, captured again. And in the letter, he talks about how the moment he got to taste the fruit uh, mm. of the tree uh, was worth, you know, was worth all the effort they did, uh, and and the and basically the torture that he knew he was gonna experience. Right. So uh, I say this because. Uh, you know, I just really, it's, it's something that I think about a lot. And, and I think about, I want to hold these amazing inspirational men uh, in all of our hearts today. And, and to, you know, because uh, this is for me, what, what real dignity is, what real like freedom is. It's not that you are given that it's you really, you are willing to dig with a spoon if you must, because you can't tolerate to live in any other way. And so for me, I think I had a sentiment of uh, that I really just couldn't bear to live in any other way. And so I wanted to uh, salvage the things I loved and I wanted to also live as a free human and a free woman. Uh, no matter where I was and I you know in my in my you know I was I grew up in a in a small town uh where uh I was you know my my you know the what was I, what I was supposed to be was a, a um someone who I guess you know turns 20 and looks for a husband or whatever and just yeah. settles down uh, but uh, I couldn't, you know, I was very lucky because my mother, who was somebody, uh, who is somebody who was, uh, you know, 
had to get married very young and do this whole thing. Uh, even though she didn't get to have the freedom uh, that she wanted, she made sure that I had this thing installed in me literally every day that I must make life with my own hands. And I think I, that really stuck with me. And I felt very repulsed by patriarchy. And uh, I was <laughs> shaved my head when I was 14 as a way to say, you know, screw everybody. I'm not going to be this, you know, girly girl. I mean, right. I, I, I love my hair now and everything. But, <laughs> but it, was, it was a way to say that I didn't, I didn't want to accept what was asked of me. So this is a long way to say that, yeah, definitely when I went back and I was this uh, woman who was perceived, you know, as, oh, I'm educated in the United States, I'm supposed to dress a certain way, I'm supposed to speak a certain way, I'm supposed to use that kind of privilege to get uh, some high paying fancy job. Uh, instead, I was found on tractors and with mules uh, and, uh, and, and I think that really confused people uh, mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, but for me, it was a pleasure because it was a way of also asserting that I can be, I can, that, that through my life without lecturing, I can show something different. Yeah. And it was a big challenge because even in some communities, uh, the men would say, would call me with the masculine uh, pronoun, right. uh, even though I go with a feminine, like I'm, I'm her, but they would call me he. And because they were more comfortable with that. And, and so for me, I had to always assert, no, I am, a, I am doing this, but I'm, I'm a woman, you know, like let's, uh, and it's, it created, um, it was hard because also, especially in the beginning, you're right, like a lot of people just didn't understand what I was doing. To be honest, I didn't fully understand what I was doing. I knew that what I was doing was insisting on doing it my way, whatever that is at any cost. Um, I, I guess I don't answer your question. No, 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 it's, I, 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 it, 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 you know, you answered to a to a different drummer. You're you're courageous, fearless. You you took risks, and and it seems that you're it's be, it's beautiful your life now. From what I can tell, you're you're able to simultaneously acknowledge your heritage, your background, your roots, your homeland. And at the same time, you operate at at an international scale where you're able to see how uh, that common language allows us to, to see grief and hardship and oppression and, and you know, environmental challenges across the world. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful that, that you, you, your identity is able to kind of rescale itself and that your empathy works on a variety of levels. And I'm sure that brings enormous satisfaction to you at this moment in your life. It, uh, it does, it does. And it's sometimes lonely, uh, very lonely. And uh, really also like there are days where I spend in bed <laughs> and I can't. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do struggle a lot some days. I mean, it gets better. It seems like you get older, it gets better for right. some reason. Uh, but, um, but it wasn't always so easy because the the old stories that were in, carved in us as children take so long to reprogram yourself right. like like how can i re like for example joy joy is something that's really powerful actually it's a really powerful um creative energy and if i were to like suggest something to anyone and to any young person trying to do something I would say you must be in joy. Like you, it has to like, you have to fly in your heart when you actually talk about whatever you're doing. If you're not, you're just settling for mediocre. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and that's where the love of magic comes in. Like, do you want to live a magical life or do you just want to live a life? 
uh, I want to live a magical life, even if it means that I sail in the ocean and I drown. Okay, I will drown and I will die having lived a magical life. I would really rather that. Um, and I wish more people would. Uh, well, I mean, I don't wish. I mean, people can do whatever they want, but but I think it would make us nicer to each other if we all followed more our joy because uh, then we wouldn't feel this tension because it, it really like the more you suppress your joy, the more resentful you become. And, and I think the more violent, it's very easy to become more violent. I mean, I, I noticed it within myself. I'm not talking about like, oh, I'm so, you know, when I suppress something in myself, uh, it becomes easier for me to be irritated with other people, but it's, it's never other people. It's always me. It's, it's never other people. So I think having joy and, and, and allowing again ourselves to fall in love. One thing that happened that was challenging, for example, but also beautiful when I started the seed library is I was basically asking farmers to take a chance, like to take a chance on something that was risky for them. And uh, they, and the reason that it, it was hard and the reason that a lot of people rejected a little bit like or were scared of what I was doing wasn't because I was doing anything so revolutionary in that like, uh, you know, they're not gonna go to jail for it or anything, but because I was asking myself and others to fall in love with something that's dying. Yeah. That requires a lot of, I mean, now I'm understanding within myself that what, if, if we are to say I was daring, is that I was in love and I allowed myself to be in love with, with, with something that was dying and, and to say, I'm still gonna invest in it. I'm still gonna love it, uh, even if it's, it's, you know, in hospice, and I'm still in love. Right. I think um, this is again, a question for us in, in, in our lives and in the world. Like when we're told that what we're dreaming about is nonsense or, oh, that's a dead subject. Like, can you be in love with something that's dying? And allow, yeah. allow for it to transform. Maybe, uh, you know, and, and, and in the process, I learned that there is no dying because nothing dies, it just transforms. But then you can be creator in what- Yeah, yeah no, it's, it, it's, a, it's a profoundly interesting topic. You know, it's, this is a segue, but it, it's related to everything you're talking about. Two, two things, I, I, I wanna go back to, to the seed because the seed operates on, on a metaphorical level. It, it also is, is literally, literally is able to capture and, and suspend uh, uh, a, a kind of biological uh, memory in, inside a very, very small amount of space. And then it can, it can remain suspended indefinitely and then be unleashed. So there's something beautifully perverse about that, given that time, our relation to time is always uh, a fleeting and, and, and the idea of stopping time, although from a from a an imaginary standpoint, it can be done. From from in terms of one's Im imagination, you could stop time as a creative entity. But literally on planet Earth, it, we, it's rare that you'll see things that that can that can freeze. And so I'm reminded of two things. In one is the ice core samples, right, at the tips of the of the planet Earth, which they remove in order to understand the history of the world, that you can actually see time in chronological order. And it's and and there there are insects and creatures and bacteria and all that stuff that that is in suspended animation. And if you were to melt it, it would be released. The other thing is I remember some years ago, I we had a project where we were working with General Electric uh, in, in New York State. I had the opportunity to go to their archives, and um, I forget for a moment. It was a it was a Thomas Edison device, and you 
wasn't the phonograph. Um, it was a cylinder that rotated and had little relief like braille. Mm. Mm. And it made sound. And when you rotate it, you could hear Thomas Edison's voice. And it, there was something, you know, incredibly uncanny, uh, unsettling, perverse, but beautiful that, that, that his voice could, could permeate the room, mm. that, that there was actually a machine that could stop time and, and hold the memory of a, of, of a human being in this particular case. So it seems to me that the, while the seeds link you directly as, as, a, uh, as an archive and library to your homeland, they, they also represent as a kind of infinite alphabet, um, all of this knowledge around the world from all the, the seed libraries. And you even mentioned, uh, and I forget the exact, uh, uh, you, you'd said something in California, they use a disproportionate amount of water to grow a certain crop. And yet some of the crops that you're familiar with don't require much water. And if only you could, that seed could migrate to a different part of the world based on resolving an inadequacy that that shared knowledge that's specific to an indigenous location can actually be transported and do good work. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the, the seed library as a, as a global proposition is, is really, really interesting. And under the right circumstances, that is the curators, that, that there's an ethical, a shared ethical mandate, that there's a lot of and, and a lot of good and beautiful work that could be done around the world that could empower communities and revitalize landscapes and territories and so forth. So I, I don't know if you could speak a little bit about your particular interpretation of, of how seed libraries may in fact begin to speak to each other and, and collaborate. Yeah, and it's actually pretty amazing because we do speak to each other already and we collaborate a lot. Uh, and I think about it um, a lot these days because I have been on the road all summer uh, in the United States. And I realized that it doesn't matter where I am, I can just you know, find who are the seed geeks and uh, I have a home, you know, I'm welcomed and they don't even need to know, like we don't necessarily know each other, but we know each other. Right. And I know like, it's so strange because, um, but it's beautiful that, you know, I, 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 you know, we feel like we can even ask each other for help, uh, for fate, like for favors. Right. Just because, you know, we, we don't even know each other physically sometimes, like we've never met, but, you know, oh, yeah, you, you have the seed library in Palestine. Oh, I have the seed library in Virginia. Come to Virginia. Oh, yeah, you're in Virginia. You need a car. You need a, you know, and, uh, and so I feel that I'm already part of another uh, a global system <laughs> and that global system doesn't ask you for your passport or your uh, visa it just welcomes you because you love life right. this is just the only thing you have to have and i think that is um that must be so with other things like i wonder if I think with seeds, it's so easy because there's so much life. You're literally like talking about life. Right. Uh, and, and, and who is not really like, and, and everybody relates to that. So I wonder like if more people would do that with, with every other, like, I don't know what makes it that with seed folk, it's just so uh -huh. easy. Um, uh -huh. And, 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 and then, yeah, you have like a global community that's in operation. I mean, we, I, can, I can fly to Thailand tomorrow and I bet you, I will be, I will be welcomed. Right. And I, I will have, a, I've never been to Thailand even. I don't know anything, 
but uh, we have this shared language, as you you said, which is it's a shared language and it's a shared value that we're not interested in the dominant world and we're going to create another world and it's based on us being part of of soil, like we're soil people, and yeah. and and it transcends everything. Well, that sounds like beautiful closing comments to me. But I, uh, Vivian, I want to thank you. I know, you know, we've never met before. Um, and you actually came to my attention based on uh, reading some uh, reviews of uh, what was it, the Chicago Architecture Biennale. And uh, I was just, and I, and I spoke to you prior to going live tonight about the fact that I thought there was a lot of synergy between your life's work and, and the mission of our school and our community. It, it wasn't about architecture, it was about people, it's about community. And uh, I thought you were beautifully poetic and articulate and, and, and actually quite inspiring tonight. So I, I do wanna thank you for taking time out and- Thank you, thank you so much for, for inviting me. I'm so honored and I'm also so elated to know that a school like yours exists. <laughs> you know, when I read about like the emails and uh, my colleague Sharon was sharing with me, I was like, are you sure like this is like what the... so yeah. I am so so I hope one day I can visit in person and, and learn more about oh absolutely and and I assure you that the students that attended tonight's lecture uh have acquired some really kind of really important life-changing insight and for those that will will hear you online in a recorded lecture so I wish you all the best Thank you. Thank um, you so much for your for your work. And, and it's really, really important. I hope we can keep in touch. And I urge any of the students who who would love to participate and contribute to your project that they reach out to you uh, privately. Thank you. Yes, please do keep in touch. I would uh, love to continue. And, and they have to they have to go see your your I don't know the title of your recent video or if it's recent on the cistern. Um, oh yeah, the cistern is uh, which um, we can share, I guess, in the chat. Yeah. Or if you want to share it with folks? Let me see. Uh, I think this is the correct YouTube link. Uh, it, it's it's a beautiful video that that she created, everyone. And uh, this is a uh, this was from last year, and it's a video. Uh oh, am I still online? Am I still yeah, you're still here. Yeah, I, I don't know where I, I lost. I don't see you anymore. But I'm, I'm trusting that you see me. Yes, um, yes. Uh, yeah, it's a video that actually I created last year with uh, my friend Samar Hasbun. And uh, it was um, actually commissioned by uh, Storefront TV. It's, uh, it's a gallery in New York. Uh, and they uh, wanted, the theme was um, self-care and how do you care for self? And, uh, you know, one of the challenges we have is the fact that uh, water is often cut off uh, and we, we, we don't have access to water. And so um, I decided to build this cistern, which uh, is a rain harvesting cistern collecting water which is actually now uh, irrigating uh, a lot of our plants and flowers. Uh, and uh, after we built it, which was a huge task, uh, I decided to go inside it. And the film uh, talks about also the fact that when we were digging, we found these um, geodes uh, in the soil, which tell the story of how ancient the soil is. Mm -hmm. and I was thinking a lot about how, you know, we were frogs and fish before we were humans and how limited our imagination is when we're like attached to a lot of ideologies that actually have nothing to do with our evolution. So this video is basically a commentary on that. And uh, I just shared the link and, and you know, Thank I'm you. happy to, to play it now or just people can watch it on their own. Uh, that's up to you. If you play it now, we'd be happy to, to see it. Well, I can play it now and it could be our like, 
after we see it, we we basically say goodbye. <laughs> thank you, Vivian. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And I'm gonna share my screen and uh, wait, share the video. Oh, I think, I'm sorry, I sent it to Christina. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> um okay it's here so i'm gonna pause it go back to zoom and now share my screen thank you thank you i think i'm sorry i am um, a little here we go is it we got it yeah great all right i'm gonna mute yeah I'm, yeah yeah okay A few more months from now, the rain will come. The cistern will fill up. The plants will drink, we will drink, and I will baptize my skin in its very waters. And we will survive the way we have before. Another summer, another unjust war, another cruel reality. You see, a hundred million years ago, we were ocean. And a hundred million years later, we are fighting not to become a desert. A hundred million tries and a hundred million defiant acts, a hundred million seeds and a hundred million plants and a hundred million trees, and a hundred million of us and we will survive. That was beautiful, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I, I guess I can stop sharing. Yeah, Vivian, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be in touch and have a wonderful night. Appreciate uh, it. It was beautiful. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye.